This lecture is part of an online algebraic geometry course about schemes, and in it we will be defining Noetherian schemes and giving a brief discussion of their properties. Um, so suppose we've got a scheme. We say it is Noetherian if it satisfies the following two conditions. First, it must be quasi-compact. And it must also be locally Noetherian. So what does it mean to be quasi-compact or locally Noetherian? Well, quasi-compact means the underlying topological space is quasi-compact. Quasi-compact means just the same as compact. It's called quasi-compact for uninteresting historical reasons. Locally Noetherian means that um, the scheme S can be covered by open affine subschemes of the form spec of Si, spec of Ri, where Ri is a Noetherian ring. Um, so this is fairly typical of scheme theory. We have a sort of a cascade of definitions where each, de each definition depends on several other definitions, and you sometimes feel there's a sort of infinite regress going on, but anyway. Um, so let's first discuss quasi-compactness. We first note that all affine schemes of the form spectrum of R are quasi-compact. So this is sort of similar to the proof that all affine varieties are quasi-compact in the Zariski topology. Um, suppose spectrum of R is covered by open sets. And we want to show it's covered by a finite number of them. Well, we may as well assume that it's covered by open sets of the form DFI, because these form a basis for the topology. So remember, DFI consists of the primes such that FI is not in the prime. Um, well, if it's covered by these open sets, this means no maximal ideal contains all the elements FI, um, because the um, DFI just consists of the prime ideals such that Fi isn't in here. So if these cover spectrum of R, then no prime ideal can contain all of them. So the ideal generated by the Fi is, is equal to R because it's not contained in any maximal ideal. So sum of Ai Fi equals one for sum Ai, almost all zero. Um, so a finite number, um, so, so we can find a solution of this with, um, so, so we can find a solution using a finite number of Fi. And this just means that the spectrum of R is covered by a finite number of our sets of the form DFI that we chose. So the, the, the quasi-compactness of the spectrum of R has something to do with the fact that if you can write one as a linear combination of elements, then you can write it as a linear combination of a finite number of them, because we're doing algebra, not analysis. Um, so, uh, so a scheme S is quasi-compact, um, 
if and only if um, S can be covered by a finite number of open sets of the form the spectrum of Ri. So in other words, they're the, the, the quasi-compact schemes are just the ones that can be built out of a finite number of affine schemes. Um, examples, um, the, the, the schemes of projective and affine varieties are all quasi-compact. You know, affine varieties are um, affine schemes and projective varieties or schemes can be covered by a finite number of affine ones. So they're quasi-compact. An example of one which isn't quasi-compact is just a disjoint union of a countable number of schemes will usually be not quasi-compact. Um, and in practice, the schemes you come across that aren't quasi-compact quite often turn out to be disjoint unions of countable number of schemes. A fairly typical example is the so-called Hilbert scheme, which parameterizes subschemes of projective space. And it splits up into a countable number of components because um, and if you've got a subscheme of projective space, there are a countable number of degrees it can have, for example, so that splits it up into a countable number of, of subschemes. Um, next, we um, will talk about not notarian spaces. Um, so, um, we recall that a topological space X is called notarian um, if and only if um, every non-empty collection of open sets has a maximal element. And this is the same as saying it satisfies the descending chain condition um, for closed sets. So that means if you've got any descending chain of closed sets, it must eventually become constant. And you might guess we define um, um, a spectrum so we do not define S to be notarian if its topological space is notarian. And the reason for this is the following problem. The problem is, um, suppose we take R to be, say, K X1 x2 and so on with an infinite number of variables and we quotient it out by the ideal generated by x1 squared x2 squared and so on then the spectrum of r is a point you can see the only prime ideal is x1 x2 and so on So this is the only prime. And a point is notarian as a topological space. However, this ideal is not finitely generated. So the ring R itself is not notarian. Um, 
So if we defined a scheme to be Noetherian, if its underlying space was Noetherian, we would have the embarrassing fact that the spectrum of a non-Noetherian ring was a Noetherian scheme, which we really don't want. So um, we, we, we define it, um, we have to define um, it in a slightly more roundabout way. We say S is locally Noetherian, if it's covered by um, open affine subschemes of the form spectrum of Ri with the ring Ri notarian. And we say it's, we remember it's notarian is locally notarian plus quasi-compact. So quasi-compact, you remember, means that you can cover it by a finite number of open affine subschemes. So this is the same as saying if it's covered by a finite number of um, open schemes of the form spectrum of Ri with Ri notarian. Um, so for example, um, projective varieties are all notarian. So they're covered by a finite number of affine varieties, which are notarian. Um, a Hilbert scheme, which I'm not going to tell you what it is, but exactly, but as you uh, I said vaguely, that it was a, um, a space parameterizing um, sub um, sub schemes of projective space. And Groth and Dick show that it was locally notarian. In fact, it's the disjoint union of a countable number of, of um, projective schemes. Um, so um, you do occasionally get examples of schemes that are locally notarian, but not notarian. But in practice, most locally notarian schemes you get are simply a disjoint union of notarian schemes. Um, and now there's a... Um, major split in algebraic geometry, which is should you restrict to notarian schemes? And there are some advantages to this. Um, most schemes in practice are notarian and um, it does make it much simpler in many ways. Um, there are a lot of technical complications you have to deal with if you um, want to deal with non-notarian schemes. It also has a disadvantage that some schemes are non-notarian And they do sometimes turn up. For example, the spectrum of a, of a non-discrete valuation ring. Um, and non-discrete valuation rings do turn up. They used to be a lot more popular before um, Growth and Dig introduced schemes, and they were heavily used in um, resolution of singularities of varieties, for example. Um, and as I said, you know, algebraic geometers seem to split into two camps. The, the ones who work with notarian schemes have the attitude that there is no point spending a lot of effort on, on this technical complication that you almost never need. And I think they secretly suspect the people who work with non-notarian schemes of you know, being the sort of people who wear hair shirts and so on. Um, on the other hand, the people who work with non-notarian schemes definitely have the attitude that 
people who work with notarian schemes are a bunch of wimps. And that if you were a, a real small fairy creature from Alpha Centauri, you handle the, the tough case of non-notarian schemes. So you have to pick which you do. Um, we're going to mostly just stick with notarian schemes for out of laziness, I guess. Um, as the name suggests, um, being locally notarian is a local property. Um, um, so in particular, the spectrum of a ring R is covered by open um, affine subschemes of notarian rings implies R itself is notarian. So in other words, um, um, you can check whether a scheme is notarian or not by looking at small open affine subsets covering it. And if all those are notarian, the, the, the ring itself is notarian. The, 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 the whole scheme is notarian. And if it's an affine scheme, then it's the, the, then the corresponding affine ring is also notarian. Um, so uh, the, the, the key point in showing this is that being in an ideal is a local property. So what does this mean? Well, suppose X is in R and I is an ideal of, of, of a ring R. Then the following are equivalent. First of all, X is in I. Secondly, X is in I F to the minus one, which is an ideal of R F to the minus one, where the open sets D F I cover the spectrum of R. So if, in other words, if we've got an open cover of the spectrum of R, we can check whether X is in the ideal by checking on each of the open sets of this cover. And the third property says that X is in IP, um, which is a subset of RP. This is the local ring at P for all P in the spectrum of R, or even all maximal P. We, we don't need to do all prime ideals. You, you could just test for max, at maximal ideals if you want. And in order to verify this, we notice that one implies two and two implies three are kind of trivial. Um, to show that three implies one, what we do is we just look at, at J, which is the ideal of all Y such that X, Y is in I. And we want to show that J is equal to R. Well, if M is maximal, if M is a maximal ideal, then X being in I, M implies um, A, times bx minus i equals zero for some i in i and a b not in i. So this is this is just the um, condition for x to be in this um, ideal of, of, of the local ring. And this implies um, a b x is in i. Um, so um, so J is not contained in, in the maximal ideal M because A, B is not in, so A, B is in J, but not in, in M. Um, 
So it shouldn't say a b not an i, it should say a b not in the maximal ideal m there. So, so j is not contained in any maximal ideal, so j is equal to r. So, so um, x is in i because 1 is in um, the ideal j. So this shows you can test whether something is an, is an ideal just by testing it at all local rings uh, of, of prime ideals of the ring. Um, so now suppose um, the spectrum of R is covered by open sets DFI. Um, then an ideal of R is determined by its images i f i to the minus one in in um, in the rings r f i as above because these sets these open sets cover r and an element is in i if and only if it's in in all these ideals i so if r has an increasing sequence of ideals I1 contained in I2 and so on. What we can do is we can look at all the sequences I1, F, I to the minus one contained in I2, F, I to the minus one and so on. Now, if all the rings R, F, I are notarian, then all these sequences must eventually terminate. And as R can be covered by a finite number of these, this means that the sequence of ideals in R terminates. So, so, so this sequence here terminates. So R is notarian. So we've shown that if the spectrum of R is covered by open subsets um, of notarian schemes, then R is itself notarian, which sort of shows that in some sense, being notarian, being, being that locally notarian really is a local property. Um, finally, I'll just make a few comments about what it means for a ring to be notarian. Being notarian for a scheme or ring is sort of vaguely related to being finite dimensional. And it is often true that notarian rings are finite dimensional. It is often true that finite dimensional rings are notarian. So this, this is usually true, but there are counterexamples, for instance, we can take the example we had earlier, k x1, x2, op2. Uh, we take a countable number of xi's and then just quotient out by the ideal generated by x1 squared, x2 squared, and so on. So this is a finite dimensional um, ring. In fact, it's zero dimensional, but it's not notarian. And it's usually true that if something is no tier and then it's finite dimensional. So it's true for local rings. Um, if you've got a local ring, it's a basic theorem of commutative algebra that it's finite dimensional. In fact, the dimension is bounded by the number of elements needed to generate its maximal um, ideal. And it sort of sounds very plausible that if something is locally finite dimensional and it's compact for heaven's sake, then surely it should be globally finite dimensional. Um, it seems very plausible, but um, there's a weird counterexample that Magata found, um, which instead of writing out, I'll just show you Nagata's only own description of it. So um, Nagata himself calls these bad rings. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit. Okay, so 
So here's his example of a bad notarian ring. So he's saying a notarian ring whose altitude is infinite. Well, the altitude was a sort of old name for the dimension of a ring. So here's got a infinite dimensional notarian ring. And what he's doing is he's taking a um, polynomial ring and a countable number of variables and then carefully localizing um, in a rather cunning way in order to end up with a ring that's still infinite dimensional, but it's still possible to prove that this ring is notarian. And the proof isn't all that difficult, but I'm not going to give it because I'm feeling too lazy. So this is from Nagata's book, um, Local Rings. And it's kind of rather a famous book because it's got an appendix with lots of horrible examples of notarian rings. Um, and um, I think before Nagata started finding all these examples, people were hoping that notarian rings and schemes were the nice collection of rings and schemes. But um, unfortunately, it turns out that you can get some pretty nasty rings and schemes that are still notarian. So this leaves the problem of what is a good condition that covers all the rings we want and excludes the nasty counterexamples. And as far as I know, there's no really good answer to this. Um, the most promising approach is maybe Groth and Dick's notion of an excellent ring. Unfortunately, the definition of an excellent ring is so complicated, no one can remember it. So it's still in some sense an open problem, I guess. OK, um, the next lecture will be on various finiteness conditions like being finite or locally of finite type.